This is the Energy Makers Show, featuring the innovators, financers, and policymakers focused on the global energy demand. Brought to you by NRG, moving clean energy forward. And here's your host, Paul Dickerson. Hi, I'm Paul Dickerson, and welcome to another episode of the Energy Makers Show. First up today, Adam Moraine, co-founder, CFO of Alteros Energies. This company focused on making energy from airborne wind turbines. Next up, Neil Dykeman, anchor of the cleantechblog.com and partner at Jane Capital Partners, a classic merchant bank investing in clean energy. All that right after this. Where will the energy come from to move us forward? From natural sources in abundant supply, or perhaps a man-made source? At NRG, we believe innovation will solve our energy needs. That's why NRG is moving away from fossil fuels towards wind, solar, and other sustainable technologies to power the smart grid, the electric car, and our clean energy future. We're using all of our energy to develop more of it. This is the Energy Maker Show, brought to you by NRG, moving clean energy forward. And now, back to the Energy Maker Show with your host, Paul Dickerson. Welcome back to the Energy Maker Show. My guest now is Adam Rhine, co founder of Alteros Energy. Adam, great to have you on the program. My pleasure. So, tell us about Alteros Energy. Uh, Alteros Energies is a startup company uh, formed out of MIT out in Boston. Uh, just down here in Houston visiting this week. We're developing a breakthrough high altitude wind turbine technology. Now out here in Texas, uh, you're familiar with wind turbines. Sure. Uh, out in West Texas, for a long time, they've been made the same way. Big steel tower, a big crane to yep. lift the, that rotor and generator onto the tower. Uh, it works real well out here in Texas, but in places that don't have very good winds or places that are hard to access, it's just too expensive. All right, but uh, give, give us a visual. What, yeah. what does this look like? So what our team did is tried to adapt a platform from the aerospace sector into the energy sector. What we did is looked around and said, is there a way we could lift the wind turbine into the air without a giant crane and steel tower? And what we did is found tethered balloons is our solution. So what we've developed is a inflatable helium-filled shell that actually would wrap around a wind turbine and lift it up into the air using a conductive cable to hold it in place and send the power down to a ground. So how heavy are these things? Uh, well, uh, tethered balloons have lifted up about uh, a ton to two tons uh, for uh, 30 years. So um, we're looking at developing a system that's between uh, one and two tons. Tell our viewers about what, what you've been doing, really trying to reverse the flow of power to something that's been already happening. Yeah, well, as, as you know, it takes a long time to develop a new energy technology that you're putting out into the field for 10 or 20 years. Sure. So what we really wanted to do was integrate components that have already been in the field, conventional wind turbines and conventional tethered aerostats or tethered balloons Smart. into a new design. Uh, and that way we could overcome some of the reliability challenges. So for example, um, tethered balloons often lift surveillance systems and they've developed uh, cables that actually send power up to power those systems. So we can go to the same vendor and say, with a slight tweak, uh, you can sell us a, a cable that's already been proven out in the field. To send the power down instead power of down. sending the power up. Yeah. So when you talk about portability, is what is the cost of taking it down, moving to another site? Mm -hmm. is, it, is it prohibitive such that once they're up, they're pretty much there? Uh, or can it always be moved as the winds change? Uh, well, there's two aspects of portability. Uh, our system's designed to be uh, towed on the back of a truck. So, but that's within about a five mile radius. So if you want to move it within a site to different locations, that can be done. We did it at our test site in Maine, took about 15 minutes. If you want to move it 100 miles away or across the, across the world, that requires a, a more expensive uh, process. And you could see that happening every couple of years. So for example, we target, uh, big uh, construction projects where you may need power for two, three, five years of the project, then you want to pack it up and send it to the next project. So you've got the balloon, power is, is coming down the power line. Uh, are you always connected to the grid? What storage concerns do you have? Uh, well, when power comes down the tether, it's just like power coming down the tower of a wind turbine. And so you can do what, what you want with it on the bottom. So you can connect it to the grid. 
uh, or you can con connect it into what they call a microgrid, which is really hooking it onto a control system and a diesel generator, uh, which is a, really what we're looking to do at most sites, so that whenever the wind blows, you ramp down that generator and are saving a lot of fuel at that site. Because with a diesel generator, most people don't know, the generators are pretty cheap. It's getting the fuel to the site that all the cost is and where the savings are. Sure. Power prices uh, are pretty cheap uh, here in the U.S. Yeah. With, with cheap natural gas and, and others. And I know uh, the, the solar market and, and even the wind market have had some challenges here. Are there better opportunities overseas for your technology first, or, or will America get, get the first few balloons? No, we're focused almost entirely in uh, sectors that rely on diesel fuel for power. Uh, and that's not really in the U.S. except for places like Alaska and Hawaii. Right. Um, so this helps us because we're not competing with cheap gas, which has been a real problem for the broader wind sector today. Sure. Uh, and more importantly, uh, when folks are facing the highest electricity costs in the world, they're really looking for a solution. And so when you're, it helps you. Uh, even the first product, which may be a little higher price, can deliver real quick paybacks when you're displacing diesel fuel that's airlifted into a site, sent on barge to a site, um, and, and that's what we're looking to do. All right, so uh, what, at what stage are you? Uh, we put up a 35-foot prototype uh, in Maine over the winter. Uh, it's about half scale, and we use an off-the-shelf uh, small wind turbine in that prototype. And now uh, our team's designing uh, and developing our first product. It'll be about 30 kilowatts. Incredible. So uh, funding-wise, are you uh, privately funded? Yeah. Uh, do you work through the venture networks? Well, you know, we work in an incubator in Boston with a dozen clean energy startups. And what we found is some of the old models aren't applying. So what right. we take is a broader view of funding. It's not straight venture capital. What we've done is taken some government research funding from mm -hmm. the Department of Agriculture and California Energy Commission. We've taken some private capital from individual angel investors. Uh, and we received the uh, ConocoPhillips Energy Prize last year, which again was a nice uh, infusion of capital for our team. Do these work offshore? Yeah, so it's something we've been looking at. You know, to do anything offshore, as the oil and gas sector guys know, uh, it takes more time and more money. Right. So uh, our first product will be designed for uh, remote sites on land, such as oil and gas exploration sites and military bases, or even sites up in Alaska. Uh, but long term, we see the, the challenge of bringing power to offshore sites is a, a huge problem we can help solve. Any cause uh, for concern with storms, hurricanes? Yeah. So, t I mean, they've had tethered aerostats in the Florida Keys for 30 years. So they've gone through the ropes in terms of uh, surviving uh, tough weather. Um, the, the one big challenge is you don't want to really put this in the path of a class five hurricane. Sure. So uh, the first deployment areas won't be the Caribbean. And, and in those sites like conventional wind turbines, you oftentimes have to take them down if a storm right. is coming. Uh, other than that, you know, aerostats are, are rated to survive uh, small hurricanes. They have lightning resistance systems. Uh, and, you know, they've been out in all sorts of weather and performed quite well. Well, Adam, thank you so much for coming in today. Thanks, Paul. <laughs>
one does you know, energy and environmental means technology. And so we kind of got in on the ground floor of the clean tech movement and uh, a lot of the investment that's gone into in, into these sectors over the last 10 years or so. What stage of investment and what, what size? We, we've done everything. We've done everything um, uh, from you know, $100,000 deals and the largest one we've done have been in the tens of millions to $100 million scale. Um, and we've been moving over the last number of years a little bit later stage than, uh, uh, than we had before. Um, we're not a fund. Yeah, we are um, uh, a classic merchant bank. Yeah, we work for our own account and for clients and partners. Yeah, putting deals together, buying into them, building them up. Yeah, raising the money for them and, and selling them on when it's time. You know, taking operating roles as well. Do you have a certain uh, type of energy that you're targeting? There's some things we're good at, and there's some things we're not. Um, my, the technical staff we've got includes ex, ex, um, Exxon and EPRI and, and Brookhaven researchers. Uh, so we've got some technical capability that's pretty broad. We love um, those national lab guys. Uh, we, we do. We do, especially after they've left there and have learned how to do business. Sure. Um, so we've actually done real well taking former scientists and uh, yeah, uh, partnering them in on deal teams. Everything we do is partnered with a technologist and a corporate finance uh, and business development executive as part of the deal. Um, so, so we've been pretty broad. Yeah, um, we've stayed away from biofuels is probably the only area we haven't ever tried to do much in, mainly because if, you don't, if you're not big and you do that, you get your clock cleaned. Sure, yeah. And you don't just look in the U.S. No, it's been, it's been international from the get-go. Our, our, as I said, our first client was an Australian bank, uh, and the second client uh, was a startup we incubated and eventually uh, took public on AIM. Um, and so we've done, cross border has been an element in almost everything we've done. How, how do you add greater value, find, finding these, these foreign opportunities and are you introducing them to the U.S. market or is it just to U.S. capital? There, there's actually been a lot of that. We, yeah, we, we found over the years when you're looking at companies moving cross border, they generally want cash or a deal and they're generally not ready for it. So most of the things we've done has been an element of market entry, uh, but the money's made basically buying and selling the company. Tell us about some of the companies. So our most uh, your most recent one was a business called SmartWire Grid. Yeah, SmartWire Grid is a technology we actually, this is a domestic one actually, we licensed out of Georgia Tech. Right. It is a, um, a power flow control device for the transmission grid. Think about it, you know, seeing as how we're sitting in Houston, Think about it as a control valve for the power grid. Right. Yeah, and uh, uh, one of the previous ones we'd done was uh, a, a, essentially a safety relief valve for the power grid. This is a, you know, a theme that we've been very interested in. It's a kind of a long-term play of if you're going to continue to put pressure on the transmission grid by adding renewables and EVs and simply shifting loads, yeah, eventually you got to spend money and rebuild that grid or you got to run it a lot smarter. And smarter means software and valves and controls and, yeah, and a lot more intelligence in the way we do energy the, uh, more similar to what we've done in, in fuels over the years. Tell me about Green Home. So Green Home is the other deal we've done over the last year or so. Yeah, this was the original pioneer in e-commerce for Green. The uh, original concept was to be kind of the overstock.com or right. the Amazon of Green. Right. Well, you know, didn't quite get the pop it wanted, and uh, we had a chance to, to buy it off the founder a, uh, about a year and a half ago. Um, and uh, E-commerce is something we know a bit about, you know, you know, technology we know a bit about. The, uh, the green products actually we knew less about than we thought. It's, it's, it's not the same world as the energy and the clean tech. You know, Tell it, me. Green, green products and green business has been, you know, it, uh, it came from, I guess, what you'd think of as, as, the, as the true granola stuff. You know, the, uh, uh, everything green meant mom and pop. Green meant very, very small. Make it in your house. Hand make. You know, but it's become you know, uh, mainstreamed over the last couple of years. And uh, you know, if you're going to mainstream these type of things, everything from coffee cups to, uh, you know, to, to paper to LED lighting, you got to have a source to market. So this company had created a way to drop ship from hundreds of vendors to uh, all green products vetted through their own product approval standard into, um, yeah, into both home and business and just hadn't had the capital or the resources or the technology behind it to be able to scale. So we picked it up and have been in the process of revamping it and uh, think we're going to do quite well off this business. You see a lot and you talk to a lot of entrepreneurs and-, and For better or worse. For better or for worse. Are, are there, a, for our entrepreneurs watching, uh, what, what are some common themes or, or common bits of advice that you try and give to help them move from one level to the next? You know, that's, that's interesting. It, it, and it kind of depends on where they're coming from. We have over the years finally figured out, you know, you don't do deals with only one person, 
you know, you know the uh, uh, the core team needs to be there, and it, and you, it takes two or three people, two or three years to pull something good right. off. It just does. You always want more cash than you think you need. Yeah, you know, you're going to pay for that dilution sometime. So we, in some respects, we might as well pay for it now and get some uh, get some flexibility. And uh, there is absolutely nothing that sells better than having a customer at the table. Yeah, you know, if you want to sell money. First, find a customer, get the customer to tell the investor, us or anyone else, you know, or the next investor in the game, hey, this is a great deal and I want that product. And then the investor writes checks all day long. Trying to sell a technology or a growth deal without customers at the table can be done, it's just a lot tougher. And after that, you know, it kind of becomes a numbers game. You gotta, you, you gotta qualify your the investor targets well, and uh, just like you qualify your co customers well, and, and then you gotta stack them up and keep selling until you're done. Did, did I hear you're also working on a blog? I started cleantechblog.com and cleantech.org about five years ago. They started off as marketing projects for us. The original thesis was, well, I want more people to come to the Jane Capital website. And it dawned on me, nobody's going to come to the Jane Capital website. Nobody cares. Right. You know, we do what we do. It's just only interesting to a limited subset. Therefore, I must create my own new website that people will want to come to and will just sponsor it. That, out of that was born cleantech.org, which uh, once we started looking around for where the hole in the market was founded in the cleantech sector, you know, it's, there's, there's no geographical center of gravity. So we created one on the web, and now we've got one of the largest networks, tens of thousands of members you know, around, uh, uh, you know, online around, around the world and the country. And you know, 2005, 2007, when we were doing this, you know, the mantra on the web is content is king. Therefore, I need a blog. Blogs were hot. So we started one, started very early in the clean tech sector, so became kind of a, you know, uh, one of the early players in, in clean tech media. And uh, uh, after that, they just started to grow and need to be fed content. And so sucks down, our little marketing project has now become a, uh, a significant portion of my day-to-day -day time. That's fantastic. Yeah, but it's, it's, it, it's been good. It's been a really good experience. And you're based in San Francisco? I was. My partner's out there, the firm's headquartered there. I'm from Houston, you know, grew up here, Texas A&M, you know, moved out to California for two years. Took me 10 years to get home. Welcome so back. about two years ago, I moved back to set up our Houston operation uh, with uh, one, of, one of my technologists who'd been here from the beginning. Well, congrats on the success. Thank, Thank you, you for coming in today. Appreciate it. And that wraps our episode of the Energy Makers show heard on the radio nationwide and seen right here at theenergymakers.com. I'm Paul Dickerson. We'll see you next week.